This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to Late Boomers. Today, our guest is John Giordano, addiction, trauma, and recovery expert and certified hypnotherapist and author. He himself is in long-term recovery and his career spans over 30 years. He's a pioneer in holistic addiction treatment. John has provided counseling and trauma recovery services to law enforcement officers and war veterans. He's a state and federal expert witness and also the chaplain of the North Miami Police Department. And I'm Mary Elkins. John has earned many degrees and certifications. He has authored two books, How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life, and Proven Holistic Treatment for Addiction and Chronic Relapse. He opened an addiction treatment facility that evolved into the highly awarded G&G Holistic Addiction Treatment in North Miami Beach, Florida, as well as this recent faith-based uh, program called JC Recovery Center. Welcome to Late Boomers, John. Thank you. Well, I, there's one book that you, you you guys left out, and it's called oh. How to Beat okay, The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. I oh, love it. that's oh, fun. That's it's great. a memoir, huh? And- yeah, that, that's my life story. That, um, I, matter of fact, my produ- one of my producers is, uh, I don't know if you guys watch uh, uh, Below Deck. The uh, television show. It. Anyway, Captain Sandy, he's the star of that. She's one of my producers. They want to make a movie out of my life story. So I'll go a little bit into my life story if you want or you want to ask me questions. Yeah, I wanted to, to start us off. I was going to ask you. Tell us about your background and your early influences that led to this point in your life and career, please. Okay. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, my family was a mafia-type family. My oh. uncle was a hitman. My father was a heroin dealer. My grandfather was a Shylock. Those are people that loan you money, and if you don't pay, uh, you'll pay one way or the other. Uh, and the rest of my family was kind of nefarious types. And um, wow. when I was eight, my father went to jail um, for four years. I got molested by some boys in the neighborhood at eight and a half. Ooh. And I got molested by my babysitter when I was nine. She was 14. Okay. And um, then I entered, I was in gangs and uh, I, I went, you know, the wrong way for a while. And, you know, and my father came home when I was 12. And, um, you know, I got, and I was still in the gangs and doing all that stuff. And anyway, I got into karate when I was 14 and a half. And the reason why I got into karate was we were driving by a karate school. One of the gang members on myself and we said, you know, I wonder how tough this karate guy is. Let me go up and see if we can beat him up. <laughs> so I went upstairs. Well, mistake, but don't do that, by the way. Anyway, uh-huh. I went, <laughs> so I went upstairs and we were watching the class, waiting for the guy to, to end the class. And. It was getting late, and I had to get home because my father was very strict. If we got home late, I would get hit with the belt on the butt. So I didn't want to get hit today, so I decided to go home on time. Anyway, um, I eventually wanted to join the class, and you had to be 15 at the time. Now, this is in 1962, so Uh it was a lot different than it is today. Little kids running around with black belts didn't happen. Um, So what happened was... I wanted to go into the class because I wanted to see if I could beat up the karate teacher. All right. I thought it was a mm-hmm. tough guy, 14 and a half. <laughs> so anyway, my mother didn't want me to go. And my father says he's going to go. And she says, no, he's not. And then they finally argued enough where my my mother gave in and they had to sign a paper for me to get into class. So the first day in the class, 
They were teaching how to, it was jujitsu. I didn't know the difference, jujitsu, karate, what did I know? Anyway, they were teaching him how to fall. And then they put us around in a circle and he was going to teach us how to block a punch. Right? So he's doing, I have a volunteer. So of course I raised my hand. Right? As he's talking to the class, I try to sneak punch him. I, that's another thing. Don't do that. Okay. All I know is I winded up on the floor. I had a foot in my throat and I had this big round face smiling at me. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, I fell in love with the martial arts. I quit the gangs. I wasn't, I was studying that day and night and I became a champion and all this other stuff. So as a, uh, Instead of me telling you the whole book, I'm going to give you a little short version of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So I said I would never, you know, I never did drugs when I was young. Uh, I started doing drugs when I was, I'm in recovery now, 39 years. Um, so what happened was when when um, I met this girl and then I started to use drug recreational because it's in the 60s. And, you know, in the 60s, that's what was going on. Anyway, um, my uncle threw my wedding. He was the hitman, by the way. And the caterer insulted him in front of the family. So the next morning, he killed him. And we had to leave town real quick. Wow. Because Sheesh. the cops were coming over the house. <gasps> oh, yeah. When you read my book, you're going to get a kick out of this book. It's pretty interesting. Uh -huh. uh, so um, that was one of the incidences that happened, among other things. Um, I also quit school in the ninth grade. And then, and then, yeah, in the ninth grade, I quit school. I got left back in the sixth grade because I was a class clown. Uh, and I didn't do my homework. I didn't pay attention. So all those traumas happened to me growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when mm -hmm. kids say to me, uh, oh, mm -hmm. you don't know my family, what it's like when I do therapy with them. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll loan your mind for a while. Let me know how you do. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, you know, they used to say, John, don't you ever watch The Sopranos? I said, no, I lived it. Why should I watch it? You know, mm -hmm. so anyway, as time went on, I said I would never be like my family. Well, I went up being just like them. I became a drug dealer. I used to do collection work for the smugglers. I used to teach one of the cartels. I used to teach their bodyguards in uh, Colombia. Um, I did a lot of things that uh, you're not supposed to do. Hey. Anyway, as time went on, I'll fast forward real quick. Um, we wind up, they doing, my family did an intervention on me because I really, you know, drugs always start off okay. You have fun and you enjoy yourself and then it gets worse and worse and worse till it got so bad that my family did, said I needed help. I'm wondering who's, who's giving them help. But anyway, I wind up, you know, they did an intervention. My mother said she'll never speak to me if I don't go to treatment. So I said, look, my mom's not like that. So let me get everybody off my back. All right, so I went to treatment. Now, I didn't go to treatment because I think I thought I needed help. I went to treatment so everybody would leave me alone, to be perfectly honest. But I had a spiritual awakening in treatment, what I choose to call that. I was very nasty when I first went in. They asked me to share my deepest feelings and secrets. They said, if I do it, I have to kill you. So, you know, I mean, it was just a, a wild ride in treatment in the beginning. Mm. And anyway, uh, long story short, uh, I never forget. I wanted to go home during Christmas Eve because I went to I went to uh, treatment on December fourth. That's my clean date, actually. <laughs> and uh, so I asked them to go home on Christmas Eve. I didn't want my family to be there and me in the hospital with the kids. I didn't want to go because of that. I wanted to go home because my friends would come over, and give me a Christmas card with Coke in it. So that's why I really wanted to go home. But they said to me. Uh, no, you can't go. And I got really angry. Now, I don't know about you ladies, but I didn't just get angry. I got rageful. Hmm. And I punched the door and in my room and I and I throwing things around and really pissed off. I wanted to get out of there. And I remember the therapist telling me, John, have you ever prayed on your knees? I said, listen, man, I got calluses on my knees. I'm a recovering Catholic, you know? So he, he said, no, for humility. I said, what do you mean? God doesn't hear you? How about if I'm in the closet? Would he hear me? You know, I was really angry. I was angry at myself. And I was angry at, at all the things I did. I didn't realize that yet because I was still clearing up from all the drugs I was doing. Anyway, I this, and this is kind of hard to believe, but I couldn't get my knee down. 
Yeah. And then I finally pushed my knee down with my hand. I couldn't get my other knee. I pushed my knee down. I said, I don't know if it's God, energy, aliens, whoever you are, please take this pain inside of me away. Mm. And it vanished like it never, ever was there. And I don't know any about anybody else, but that never, ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. I tried to wow. get it back. It didn't yeah. come back. And that was kind of like my spiritual awakening. Mm-hmm. Into, well, and from there on in, I, I started to wake up. I started to, instead of blaming God and blaming my family or blaming my wife, and I, I changed. I looked at John instead of everybody else. And wow. that's how I started to go. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. they say, don't make any changes the first year. My wife was still using drugs at the time. Uh, and I was clean. And I would come home, and I, I never forget it. She picked me up in the hospital after after I was getting out, and she hands me a vial of coke. And she says, "I'll oh, just do one line, you know. Mm-hmm. You, you haven't done it in a while." I said, "No, no, 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 no." Mm-hmm. So I kept telling my therapist, "I can't live here anymore. This is mm-hmm. not good for me, mm-hmm. you know." So finally, yeah. after nine months, we got divorced. Uh-huh. I wind up anyway. Um, it was like she got the car, she got the house, she got the kids, she got everything. Um, I was homeless, and well, well, a friend I of mine had a question. Hotel. How did how did you how did you cope with it all? How did you cope with all this abuse and addiction, well, and now yeah, being I divorced? What, I coped then, with what they yeah. told me to do, which I didn't believe in. I'll be I'm very honest with you. I kept saying, "I thought you said it was going to get better." My life. They said, "John, did you use today?" I said, "No." They said, "It already got better." What am I mm-hmm. going to say? Oh. They were right. All right. Yeah, every yeah. time I every time an addict uses to run away from a problem. He creates or she creates nine more problems. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and, and that's the way it is. Yeah. How did you, you change path, your life but... path? What? How did you change your life path? Well, okay, so I was in I, I was in this hotel room. I had a bicycle somebody loaned me. My friend owned the hotel. Actually, it was an ALF, an adult congregant living facility. Mm-hmm. And here I am at a room. I had. Two beds in there. I had a little warmer. I had a, a bicycle somebody loaned me. I had a jar we used to put quarters in when I had quarters. Then I was teaching karate and making some money teaching classes and stuff. Now, I used to sell drugs and do collection work. All right? So now I couldn't do that anymore. So I mm-hmm. didn't know what I was going to do. Okay? But I wanted to help people because I got help. And I was going to the meetings. I hated the meetings. I'll never forget... They t- guy come up to me says, because uh, I used to curse God, you know, as a God, what is God? God's bull crap, you know? I, so he says, hey, John, how about, you, you know, your, as your higher power, uh, G-O-D? I said, look, man, I know how to spell. <laughs> he says, no, how about good orderly direction? So oh. That was my God for the first couple of years. Mm-hmm. Then I got a God of my understanding eventually. And anyway, uh there's a whole story with this. I, I, it's a long story, so I don't want to. Uh, anyway, I wind up, uh, the guy who owned the hotel, all right, knew me for years. I worked for him on and off in the medical centers and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and another, you know, side jobs that I was doing. And I said, look, I says, uh, I want to open up a treatment center. Now, the only thing I knew about treatment was I was in a treatment center. I knew nothing about a treatment center. So he says, uh, I says, I got this doctor who's a famous doctor. He says, if you have that doctor, he says, I'll give you the money to open up your treatment center. So I says, he says, well, how much do you need? I don't know how much I need. I said, oh, give me a 250000 He said, okay, you got it. If you have him, you got it. I lied. I didn't have anybody. But the doctor was my doctor. So I went into his office one day, and I says, hey, doc, I have a quarter of a million dollars. Would you like to be my partner while I'll open up a treatment center? Uh, he was a comedian, so he says, you know, John, I was just thinking about that when you walk through my door. So, <laughs> so we wind up opening up a treatment center. And Great. I wind up hiring. I, I didn't know it was right to do, wrong to do, rather. I hired the people in Mount Sinai Hospital. That's where I went to treatment. And I started hiring people and giving them more money than we're making in Sinai. So they wind up going with me. And the doctor who was the medical director there. So anyway, my therapist who was my therapist that helped save my life. He was making 29000 a year. I gave him 50000 This was 19, 
85. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he eventually came with us. He was the program director. I made him the program director of the, the, the program we're in. I went back to school. I got my degrees as, you know, I started getting, I, I did 300 hours. You have to get an education of addiction, the mental health. And, and then uh, you need 6,000 hours of uh, supervision. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happened was all of a sudden we were packed. All of a sudden we couldn't make payroll. I said, that's impossible. So my buddy who gave the money said, they're stealing. Now, I'm a street kid, all right? I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have anything. If you cheat me, I punch you in the face. You know, that's just the way it is in the street. So what happened was that he said, they're stealing. I said, no, they're in recovery. I got sober to get stupid, okay? So anyway, <laughs> they only had three years of recovery, mm -hmm. right? They still were new. In the recovery process, just because you quit drugs and alcohol doesn't mean the behaviors go away. It takes time mm -hmm. to redevelop new behaviors mm -hmm. and get rid of the old ones. So I walk into the doctor's office. I said, are you stealing? And he put his head down and he says, well, I have an addiction, a sex addiction. He was buying girls' apartments and he was uh, buying hookers and all that stuff because the checks would go in his name because he was the medical director. And he was the head of the program. So that's what happened. Then what happened is my therapist didn't didn't like the fact that his client was his boss. So anyway, long story short, they tried to take the program away from me. They did. They wind up uh, telling me that if you you know your your friend is stealing, who never had the opportunity to even touch the checkbook, you know. And the whole staff went with them because here I am, a client. These were my peers. So nobody believed anything that the doctor was doing this. Anyway, mm -hmm. long story short, uh, they gave me the outpatient program, which had three clients in it. Okay. They gave me 25%. They made millions of dollars. I made a salary. And uh, I had an idea that we should have a total continuum of care and to do a detox, residential, inpatient, residential, PH, possible hospital, all the way down, all the, the different levels of care. They liked the idea. Then I had a whole bunch of people. I stayed there for three years, biting my lip. They, this guy always, that therapist always was trying to get rid of me. Uh, he couldn't get rid of me because the doctor's secretary used to be his girlfriend, and she really liked me, so she protected me. So mm -hmm. that, that, that story. I've got a anyway, pivot uh, question. I've got a new question, but this okay. is kind of a, pi a pivot from this. Uh, okay. I wanted to ask you, because I'm very curious about this. How can plant medicines such as Ibogaine be used to treat addiction? Oh, That's one of, the, one of the things you were using, right? Okay. So let's pivot away from me for a second. Let's talk about this. All right. Ibogaine, okay, came from West Africa with the Weedy tribe. It was used as a rite of passage. How it came out into our preview, our, our, our vision, was there was a gentleman named Howard Lutzoff. He was a heroin addict, a very, very heavy-duty heroin addict who did a lot, a lot of heroin. He was looking for a new high, so he went to Gabron in West Africa to find this new high called Ibogaine. Now, Ibogaine yeah. is a psychedelic, okay? Uh -huh. So he does this substance. He wakes up the next morning totally detoxed. Now, let me explain to you about detox, okay, if you may or may not know. Usually, if you're detoxing or for opioids or opiates, all right, it takes anywhere from seven to nine days mm -hmm. okay, to stabilize. Not to detox, but really to stabilize a person, okay? Unheard of 24 hours. Not only do, did he get stable, with minimum residual, he had no more cravings. Being a good addict, he says, wow, I can make money from this. So he decided to open up a treatment center in Panama with his wife. And then they got a hold of Dr. Deborah Mash. Now, Dr. Mash is a pioneer in Ibogaine medicine. She's a neuromolecular scientist at the University of Miami School of Medicine. She was the head of the Brain Bank and the Alzheimer's Foundation. Mm -hmm. And she's a researcher. And she heard about Ibogaine. 
and she was doing research and I began, and he asked her to, to be the medical director to go over to um, uh, Panama with them. Well, as I said, behaviors don't change right away. She could no longer work with him. So she went to and opened up in St. Kitts. Now, before that, I'm going to digress a little bit. She was doing some FDA trials. That's how she got involved with him on um, Ibogaine. And I saw it in the newspaper. I called her up. I said, you know, I'd like to be part of your study. She says, oh, no, 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 I'm too busy. She says, thank you very much, but hung up on me. I says, oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So I didn't pay attention. Six months later, I get a call. Hello, this is Dr. Mash. I says, oh, I remember you. You hung up on me. <laughs> so she says, so she laughed. And she says, everywhere I go, I hear your name, Giordano. She says, I don't know who you are, but everybody points to you. So how would you like to work with me? I said, I would love to. So what happened was she used to bring her clients to me. We would put a heart monitor on them. We would do all the medicals. And uh, then we would go to St. Kitts. And I would, I would counsel them and do integration therapy with them and things like that. And mm -hmm. then what we would do, we would put them in a bed. We would put uh, an IV in their arm. We put a heart monitor on them, and he, you know, a uh, heart monitor on them. Uh, we put a headset on them, uh, and then eye shades to keep them in a containment field. The headset had music. We would give them a test dose of ibogaine to see how they tolerated. If they did, then we would give them a full dose. Then about eight, ten, twelve hours, depending if they're a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer. Okay, they would come out of their journey. They would go back into their into their childhood, they make it simple as an adult, and they have what is known as a cathartic experience. So they would mm. have resolution of all these traumas that they had growing up. Wow. And they would come out. Oh, no, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing That's... substance. Wow. When done, proper, when done properly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carefully. So that's what we did. Now, as far as my treatment center that I had, the way I did that, I was working for, I digress a little bit for New Life, which was my treatment center. Then I had another one that I got beat on also. The guy was a corporate raider. I didn't know. I, mm -hmm. I built the whole place up and they stole it from under me. I didn't have a lawyer again. And I'm a street kid. What did I know about lawyers? Okay. Well, I learned, by the way. <laughs> anyway, I, but this woman I was going out with talked me into opening up an outpatient program. I had $300. My friend owned the building. I said, how much is it for the 750 square foot room? He said, how much money you got? I said, I only have 300 because I had a spending addiction also. Mm -hmm. So whatever money I had, I, I spent. Anyway, long story short, I started with $300. I got my friend to help me with the business part. All right, because I used to take money, put it in my pocket. I didn't know who owed me what. I used to say, ah, don't worry, they pay me anyway. You know, because he wanted to see my books. I said, what books? You know, so anyway, what happened as we went along, we got a hold of his son who was an internet genius. I did the branding. I developed the program. I graduated. I got my, my certifications. I did all that stuff. And we wind up selling it in 2012 for $45 million. Oh, good for mm -hmm. you. Well, did you practice hyperbaric medicine there? And, and talk okay, about that a little and how, the, and, talk about and, it. Everybody, and, believe it or not, and I went to a couple of conferences over the years. Nobody's ever forgotten my treatment. So we had a phenomenal reputation. We had tremendous outcomes. We did hyperbaric medicine. That's oxygen under pressure. That actually heals the brain. Nobody's going to argue that drugs and alcohol doesn't damage the brain. We did acupuncture. It's only been around for 5,000 years. What the hell they know, right? Mm -hmm. Then we did amino acid therapy. We did... Uh, uh, aromatherapy. We did lymphatic massage to get the drugs out on a cellular level. Level. We did colonics to clean out the lower intestines. We did light and sound therapy. We did neurofeedback. We did biofeedback. I mean, we did things. We did heavy metals testing for heavy metals. We did micronutrient testing to see where your deficiencies were. We did gut testing. We were talking about gut twenty years ago. Now everybody talks about it's the second thing. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know most of uh, dopamine and serotonin, the feel-good drugs that we manufacture naturally, come from your gut. 
Mm. Oh, you will know that. We have more neurons in your gut than you have in your brain. Really? Now, what happens is it goes the, the serotonin dopamine goes up into your through your vagus nerve and deposits it into your brain. So if your gut's out of whack, your head's out of whack. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, going back just a little bit, I want to complete the sentence about ibogaine. Ibogaine blocks the opioid receptor sites, is what it does. It was used as a rite of passage in the weedy tribe. So uh, the pharmaceutical companies do not want this here. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, they cannot replicate it where they can take it over. Okay? Because you can't it's a plant. You can't say it's mine, you know. So that's what Ibogaine does. Now, ketamine is also another substance. I'm one of the leading experts on all this stuff. Ketamine is a um, an anesthetic that they use for when you get operated on. At low doses, it turns into a psychedelic that goes into, just like all the plant medicines, go into what I call your hard drive. If you look at your brain like a computer, okay, and talk therapy deals with the software of your computer. But what's really driving the software is your hard drive. Just like if you if you erase something on your computer, it's always on your hard drive. That's why when the FBI comes to your house, they take your hard drive. They don't care about your computer. Right? <laughs> so the bottom line is that's where all your information is. So what these medicines do, okay, under the right circumstances, not for partying, all right, go into your hard drive. And open that door to your subconscious where, where you store things that you don't even know are there that color the way you look at life. Oh, mm -hmm. And you look at it, instead of through an emotional lens, you're looking at it through an intellectual lens. Because as you know, your past are your lessons. The present is what creates change. And the future is not here yet. So. <laughs> People that get anxiety live in the future. People that get depressed live in the past. <laughs> and they bypass the present. The reason it's called the present, because it is. It's a present. It's a gift where mm -hmm. you can change everything. That's so wonderful. Uh, these are some of the things that, see, treatment centers do not treat people comprehensively or holistically. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know what the word holistic means. If you look it up in a dictionary, it means holism, comprehensiveness, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we keep treating from your neck up. Well, if that's the case, leave your body home and just send your head to treatment because <laughs> if that's what you want to talk to all day long, why do you need the body? If you look at the way we're built by your creator, however that is to any of us, okay, this is a system, just like our planet. What happens on the other side of the world can affect on this side of the world. What mm -hmm. happens here, down here, can affect up here. So it's a cohesiveness that you have to have in order to stabilize this system. Okay, so to me, this gift of a body and mind and soul and spirit was what God, whatever God is to anybody here, Okay, that's the gift that we got. Now, what we do with this gift is our gift back to that creator. So how are you how are you treating this gift? Okay, and what kind of gift you're giving? So what's what most of the time, if you look at addiction, addicts and alcoholics, they do not eat right. They have a lot of sugars, a lot of processed food. Okay. They uh they definitely get damaged in their brain by using drugs and alcohol. So let's talk to the brain. Let me know how you do to clean the damage up. It mm -hmm. doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. That's like talking to a cut and saying, all right, cut, heal. Okay? Uh, mm -hmm. That might work if you really know how to focus, but normally it doesn't work. So well, can you talk you a little work? bit of, can you talk, we just been through a big pandemic and all this, and what do you think the effect of quarantine and self-isolation has, what effect has that had on addiction relapse? Well, any addict that has to spend time alone in his mind, is like walking down a bad street. Yeah. I'll oh, put it to you yeah. that way. Okay. Yeah. We're not meant for isolation. We're meant for relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, and that's what happens uh, in life with people. 
in your history. See, there are, uh, there are no failures in life. There are only lessons. Mm-hmm. I learned more from my mistakes than I learned from my successes. Anybody yeah. would tell you that, that knows anything about anything. The bottom yeah. line is, is that whatever happens in our life colors the way we look at our life and other people. You're in a relationship. The guy cheats on you. The girl cheats on you. Okay, now you're suspicious of everything else that moves and walks. Okay, now you might withdraw. Okay, or you might just look at people more in depth than you would normally look. If you look hard enough at somebody, I promise you, you're going to find faults. Okay, just look in the mirror. So you know. So the bottom line is, is that as we get older, sometimes if you're not working on yourself and you're not aware, you become very cynical and jaded and then become very bitter, okay? And then become very lonely because we withdraw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, I I do a lot of couples therapy and stuff like that. And it was really interesting. I, I felt like a fraud doing couples. I mean, I'm married four times. My father told me, keep doing it till you get it right. So, you know, this time I got it right. I got the best wife in the whole world. Okay, mm-hmm. we're together 28 years. It's like I just met her yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I always right. go to that and always say that. I never, my all my friends say, Where did you find this woman? I said, Haven't she found me? What happened with that? That's a cute little story you might like. Mm-hmm. Um, she was in my treatment center, my first treatment center that they beat me out of. I never knew who she was. I never, I had never paid attention to the women because they're all very needy in treatment. They're addicts, you know, uh, highly manipulative and. I had enough problems with myself, never alone that I have to meet somebody else. So uh, I always stayed away from that. Anyway, over the years, she was in a couple of my classes. I was teaching group therapy. I was teaching, doing lectures and stuff. And uh, one day she was in uh, an, doing internship at a hospital that I was doing group in. She came walking in and she was chewing gum. I said, look, get the gum out of your mouth and sit down. So she sat down and she was doing group with all the guys. Well, she's a very beautiful girl. Everybody's looking at us. Like all of, all of a sudden, the guys, everybody changed. You know, we grew. That's what they do. <laughs> Anyways, my son said, hey, my, my son I had in, at work with me because he got asked to leave school because he was acting out, of course. Okay. And he also was an addict. So that was another issue. Anyway, uh, he said, that girl really likes you. I said, oh, yeah, good. So I handed my card. I said, look, if you want to be an intern, here's my business card. Call me when you want to be an intern with me. So two weeks later, I get a call. I said, oh, yeah, I remember you. I said, you want to be an intern? When do you want to start? He says, no, I want to go out with you. So I says, oh, okay. And so we wind up going out. Three months later, I was building this treatment center that I had. that I started with the $300. And I said, look, she so had a brand new car. The kids, she had two children. They were destroying the car. I says, look, sell your car. Give me the money. And one day I'll buy your car 10 times better. She said, okay. Her family got crazy with her. She sold her car and gave me $20,000. And seven, eight years later, I bought her a Bentley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's my story. It's, it's a, a good story. story. It is a cute story. And, yeah. and she always says, she, and she still says, she says, I have faith in you. She says, I always felt in my gut that you're honest and you're going to be successful. I love that. I want to pivot a little bit and talk about the government policies and how they've affected addiction treatment because everything is in chaos right now regarding that. Okay, I'm going to tell you the real chaos that nobody's talking about. Not the government. It's not the treatment centers only. It's them too. It's the insurance companies. Oh. See, what nobody understands is this. You know, Kathy, if you come to treatment with me, if I don't put you on medication, whether you need it or not, you can't be in treatment with me. That means uh, you're not sick enough. Right. That's number one. Anybody coming off drugs and alcohol are going to be depressed and have anxiety. Mm-hmm. That's normal. Everything comes to the surface then. Okay? That's number one. Number two, we call detox detox centers. They're not detox centers. They're stabilization units. Mm. Mm-hmm. If you're going to de- if you're going to detox somebody, all right, that means to detoxify, not put other drugs in. Yeah, that's another story. Okay, now what happens is only you get to stay maybe six or seven or eight days in, in detox. 
Then they put you in, um, they want to put you in residential. So maybe you stay two weeks there or three weeks, maybe. Okay. Mm-hmm. And everybody has to write baloney in the reports. Okay. The soap notes, because if you write that he's doing really good, he may be really good that day, but then tomorrow he's not doing good. Then they say, well, he don't have to be there anymore. Mm-hmm. Remember, yeah. here's the problem. Okay. Insurance company's job is not to pay you. Mm. Treatment center's job is to get paid. Whenever you have that dynamic, you have yeah. a problem. Yeah. Now, there's the 28-day program. Are you guys familiar with the 28-day programs, uh, uh, treatment programs? They're 28 days. The way it's mm-hmm. been 70 years this model's been in place, there's only a 5 to 8% recovery rate. Mm. Why in the world so would you good. continue to do something, okay, that fails all the time? Mm-hmm. All right? So how did he get started? You've got these two kids that went to school. This is the way I, I heard it. Could be wrong. Could be right. I don't know. Uh, they came up with this program. They sold it to Hazleton. Hazleton sold it to the insurance companies, and it started. But it was based on alcoholism. Now, 70 years ago, alcoholism and today are night and day. Mm-hmm. To get to find a pure alcoholic today is very difficult. Most of these kids are doing fentanyl. They're, do, they're doing Xanax. They're doing all kinds of mollies, of every drug known to man. Mm-hmm. And it's really damaging the brain. Seriously. Right. All right? I imagine. So now, remember, they go to detox. They're there for seven days. Right? Then they leave. They come into, into a treatment center. They're only allowed to stay maybe 28 days, maybe three weeks, maybe two weeks. It all depends, right? And then what? And then we send yeah. them back out. I mean, well, this kid, are, they're dying. Now, here's the thing. I have a way how to fix it. But I just got to get to somebody who I could talk to, okay, because it's real simple. The insurance companies, are, as smart as they are, are dumb as a rock. And I'm going to tell you why. If you got an insurance card, and let's say, Kathy, you go to me for treatment. Now, after you, you're done with me for treatment, you relapse. Now you go to Mary for treatment. Then after that, you relapse and you go to Harry and you go to Louie. And you go to all these different places and then you die or you just keep going to treatment. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know how much money it's costing the, the, the insurance companies? Yeah. Okay. Because the person so here, never gets here's well. That's the answer. It's a real simple answer. The brain needs to heal, okay? It's like doing a heart operation and saying, tell the doctor he's got five minutes. <laughs> open him up and fix the heart and close him back up. It's like stupid, all right? How can you heal a brain? Guys are using drugs for 20 years in 28 days. Mm-hmm. Can't do it. And then they want to ship them to outpatient and, and, and hospital, hospital where they go to groups, but they're on their own. No well, good. Talk to us about... How does diet affect addiction and recovery? Before I get to that, but let me just okay. give a real quick thing, okay? The way to do this is they should be in inpatient treatment where they're not out on their own for 60 to 90 days. Now, mm-hmm. depending on the severity of the illness, second of all, if they relapse, they go back into treatment for two weeks. If they relapse again, their insurance doesn't cover it for a whole year and they have to go to a public program. Mm-hmm. Now, where did I come up with that? Well, they have such a thing as called a physician's referral network. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is that? <clears throat> That's where physicians that get caught using drugs and alcohol, they have to go in 90 days inpatient and five year aftercare. They oh. have a 90% recovery rate. Oh. <laughs> so we have efficacy. We have something that works. Now, when you talk about diet, you know what addicts eat? Diet, they eat garbage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if obviously, you eat, uh, obviously you in, your, in your treatment centers, they, they're taught not to eat garbage, right? Well, right. You're and teaching. The problem, well, the problem is the treatment center, I'm, tr- I'm, I'm doing my best to change a lot of the things they're doing there. Mm-hmm. Because we deal with, like, Ambetter, which is the lowest insurance that you can possibly get. Here's what the insurance companies have done to the treatment centers. They put in so many regulations Okay, and so many things that you have to, the standards that you have to, you know, uh, do that it costs you so much money to treat a client. 
but they don't want to pay you enough to even treat them. Right. So you're treating them with bare bones. Okay. And they relapse. You know what the real truth is? They want us to die. Because if addicts and alcoholics die, they don't have to pay for anything anymore. And that's the only answer I can come up with. Why would you use a, 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 a system that doesn't work mm. mm -hmm. continuously for years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you talk about government, government, they're idiots. Okay, they don't know anything about anything. All they know about is looking good, not being good. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. care who's president, what if you want to go Republican, Democrat, they don't care about us. They only care about themselves and their job. It's <laughs> quite evident if you see how much work they're getting done. Right, if I right. had anybody like that working <laughs> for me, I fired them. Probably. Mm -hmm. Talk about telehealth and out and in outpatient treatment. Does it really work? Well, let me ask you a question. Would you rather talk to a television or a person? Well, yeah. <laughs> Although I, I do talk to the television sometimes. Depends on if the television is going to talk back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, here, here's the deal, okay? Telehealth was a way of shortcutting things, okay, number one. Uh, does it work for people? Some people just like to talk and hear themselves and talk to the therapist. But, you know, I guess information is information. But personally, okay, it may work for some people. I never poo-poo anything. If it works for you, go do it, you know. But my own personal biases, I like human contact. That's what's wrong with our society today. These kids, they don't talk anymore. They text. Yes. So nobody's talking. Everybody's texting and texting. You can, you know, you don't know what's the nuances of what they're really saying. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. you know, we're from a different world, man. This this world, I don't recognize this planet anymore. I don't even know where I am. You know, well, what uh, what role do you think genetics play in in addiction? Okay, well, I work with Dr. Blum. He's the gen geneticist. I'm on his research team that found uh -huh. the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene, which is the main addiction gene, okay? Oh. Now, just because you have that gene doesn't mean you got a life sentence of addiction because there's such a thing as epigenetics. Now, epigenetics means the social environment can change the gene expression. Mm -hmm. But there is a gene that mm -hmm. actually is the main addiction gene. So look at this. Your gut's out of whack. Okay, you're not manufacturing enough serotonin and dopamine. You're going through your vagus nerve. You're going into your brain that's deficient because you got this gene that's, that, that, that doesn't allow enough receptor sites to receive dopamine and serotonin. So what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be chasing the buzz. Okay, what Dr. Blum has coined the phrase, see, we don't look at alcoholism, addiction, uh, uh, drug addiction, eating disorders, gambling sex addiction, work addiction, we don't look at it as separate, even though the symptoms may be separate. We look at an RDS, reward deficiency syndrome. What does that mean? That means a lack of dopamine and serotonin. Mm -hmm. And that's what addicts chase. Mm -hmm. Now, there's not. I don't know an addict that doesn't have more than one addiction. Cocaine mm -hmm. addicts usually gravitate to a sex addiction. Alcoholics gravitate towards gambling. Uh, it's amazing when you start to really look at the stats with all this stuff, mm -hmm. right? That's not cut in stone, but that's usually they have more than one addiction. Then they go into eating disorders. Most women have eating disorders. And now we're starting to show that a lot of men are starting to have eating disorders. Mm -hmm. All right? So what happens is people, like you see when a heroin addict quits heroin. And they go to meetings, usually they're about 50, 60 pounds overweight eventually. Mm -hmm. So now they got diabetes. Now they have high blood pressure. And now they're not dying from drugs and alcohol. Now they're dying from a health crisis. I mean, this is what goes on. It's a continuing cycle. All right. They're not really teaching people to look at their whole body and life, exercise. It, very important. Now, what does exercise do? It lowers stress. What does stress do? It depletes dopamine and serotonin. But it also raises dopamine and serotonin. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are meant yeah. to move, not to be stationary. Mm -hmm. 
So now when you have a body that's sitting in front of TV with a clicker, <laughs> doing drugs, eating garbage, sugars and processed food, what do you think's going to happen? I tell you what, if you got a car and a gasoline car, go put diesel fuel in it. It's fuel. Let me know how your car does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, you can't put diesel in gasoline cars. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> All right? So that's what they're doing. They're putting diesel fuel in the gasoline car. Yeah. Well, what, you wear so many hats. What would you say is the most rewarding part of your career? Helping God's kids. I love that. That's an easy one. Mm. Oh. Yep. Got to write that that's, down. That's really good. And John, what would you like our listeners to have as a takeaway today? Okay. Never give up. Oh, let me, could I read uh, yeah. a little paragraph here? Yes, please. Okay. This is the message. This is why I wrote this book, to motivate people. Hmm. Okay. To show them no matter, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what kind of family you have, no matter what kind of education you have, no matter what gets in your way, you can be successful. So here's my story. The kid from the South Bronx who never gave up. Here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, that people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano. I'm a recovering addict who turned $300 into $45 million. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell. And by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. Oh, thank Beautiful. you. Thank you. That is inspiring. Well, that's my, yeah, that's what thank I want you. to share with the world. Oh, thank Beautiful. you, okay? John. You know, I used to think I was cursed. Okay. I found out I was blessed. I mean, being molested, not going to school and getting left back and getting cheated by my doctor and my therapist and going through all the stuff and my family, you know, and my own, you know, sicknesses. And here I am, I'm on the other side and I'm still working on myself because <laughs> it's a never ending job. It's not, you know, I, all I know is one thing. I remain teachable. And what I know is I don't know. Mm, yeah. And that's how I go through life. Lifelong learners. Absolutely. Right. You are, you are uh -huh. an inspiration for all of us. Our guest today on Late Boomers has been John Giordano, addiction treatment expert and more. His website is johnjgiordano.com, and that's J-O-H-N-J-G-I-O-R-D-A-N-O. -O. You can visit there for further information, for more information on his books and his work and his treatment centers. Thank you, John. It's the letter J, not J-A-Y. It's the letter J. That's mm -hmm. right. John J. Jordan. Mm -hmm. We want to thank our listening audience and remind you all that we're on YouTube on our Late Boomers podcast channel. Also, please subscribe on your, flip, on your favorite podcast platform and give us a five-star review, please. We're grateful for our audience. And please follow us on Instagram at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins and at Late Boomers. We hope we can inspire, motivate, and entertain you. We'll see you again next time. Thanks again, John. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to ewnpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here 
and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.